never get mixed up. I told y'all, you know, I asked God to help me graduate before I was 60. Well, he did it. He kind of does his thing his own way, and sometimes he does things that kind of like, you think maybe you're getting a joke played on you? And so maybe this was the joke, but uh, I graduate. I mean, my last class is December 9th. I turned 60 on December 11th. And I graduate on December 14th. So tell me God. God's not awesome. Let's see. Bring everything out of the way. Turn around, turn it off, whatever it is we've got to do. God's got this thing. Amen. Not so awesome. There's something special in the air. We just got to see it. We got to, we got to want it. We got to see it. We got to want it. And, and it's right there if we want it. We're on the edge of, we're coming out. The Lord showed me years ago, the Lord showed me that, that, that we were, this church was marching through the wilderness. And that there was coming a time when the wilderness was going to be a thing of the past and we're going forward. And I believe with all my heart, this is the time. This is what's happening amongst us. And so that's why I said this, why I said this morning, we go home and say, oh God, the preacher thinks the sky's falling. No, I don't. It's called PM. Has anybody ever done maintenance? Anybody ever been a maintenance supervisor? Anybody ever been an industrial engineer? <laughs> you handle things before it happens a whole lot better than you can handle. You can, you can control it from happening a whole lot better than you can get back control after it's gone crazy. Amen? So that's all that is. Don't think I've got the sky's falling. I'm just trying to keep us going good. Amen? Amen. There you go. <laughs> all right. Okay, so, so let's see here. Let's see. Like running here. It did work. There we go. Part two. I saw those guys out in the parking lot today. You know, I, I told the guys, I, I, I minister to the heroin addicts again. I know you hear it all the time. I don't want to bring it all up all again, but, you know, I minister to heroin addicts at, uh, at Pitt Detention Center on Monday mornings early and on Friday mornings early. And, and uh, they said, well, I, once God gets a hold of us, are we going to be different? I said, yes, but let me just tell you something. I said, uh, I pastored in Williamston at Whitefielders Church of God, and we grew from about 50 to 150 in just a few months. It wasn't long. It just, we just grew. And the church, I would say 50-plus percent of the church was ex-drug addicts, drug dealers, and prostitutes. And my boys would come from school and be really upset and looking all depressed. I go, what's wrong, son? They go, they say that you've got to be a dealer. <laughs> and I said, a dealer? Dealer what? They said, all those prostitutes and drug dealers and drug addicts, you've got to be a dealer in order to get all them people there. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, tell them, I tell them who my dealer is. I said, uh, 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 he's out there on, uh, on, on, on uh, Doodle Hill. <laughs> That's where the church was at. Tell him he's out there on Doodle Hill. His, his initial or J.C. Yeah, Jesus, amen. And so, this, so those drug addicts, they were talking to me, and they're fighting. I mean, I'm not kidding. I told you, I'm going there to be blood on their face. We're coming in there fighting, you know, trying to get them settled down so we can talk about God. <laughs> and so, as I'm getting settled down, I told them that they said, well, is there ever going to come a time when we just get along perfect? And I said, yeah, in heaven. Amen. And I told them, I said, those guys were so excited about Jesus. They would sing and they would worship and they would shout. They would shout at a drop of a hat. They would drop the hat in order to shout. But they'd get out in the parking lot and fight just like that. And so I'd be in there praying with them and blessing them and going outside and pulling them apart. You know, uh, and, and so uh, uh, there's people in our lives that are very difficult to deal with. Amen? You know, a, a math teacher, I, I, I was... I was thinking about this. Thing. Sometimes we just don't get it. Remember, we're talking about cognitive block and cognitive lock. There's two different ones: cognitive block, cognitive, cognitive lock. When you get, when your brain gets locked in on something, then it blocks out everything else. I'm going to talk about that uh, maybe in a few weeks. But right now, you know, when you get thing, when you get that in your mind, that's how it's going to be. If you're not careful, it will let you miss what God's got for you. I, I, I've missed so many things that God had for me, and I didn't realize it because I had my cognitive lock on. Or a cognitive law. There was a math teacher who saw little Johnny wasn't paying attention in class. So she called on him and said, Johnny, what are 2, 4, 28, and 44? 
Little Johnny quickly replied, NBC, CBS, HBO, and the Cartoon Network. <laughs> That's my new book. Is that better? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes we just don't, we don't, we don't get it. Amen. I, I'm so excited because I see God doing something special. You know, you might say, well, uh, what happened to what we, we've had the church full so many times? Yes, we have. And, and we're going to have it again. But I really believe that the revolving door is, is stopping. The revolving door is going to shut. And you're going to see a lot more come in than go out. And that's going to be cool. Because every church has revolving doors. It just depends on the size of the church how much you notice how the doors are revolving. Amen? So, so dealing with difficult people. Now, now, now this is going to take up from where we were last week. I just want to, you know, Philippians, let, uh, 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 do all you can. Where my Bible go? I had a Bible in here. Oh, okay, there you go. Oh, I probably put it there. Okay. I was trying to just help out whoever did it. Because <laughs> I do things like that. Amen? Very much so. Philippians chapter 2. Y'all stand for the reading of the word. I still need to get this out. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Verse 2. Fulfill you my joy that you may be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. It does not mean that you have your robots and you're all having thinking the same thing all the time. It just means that you're in the same direction, going in the same direction with the same attitude. That nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lotus of mind that each other uh, esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things. But every man on the things of others. Let us find being you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Stretch forth your hands this way. Father, we love you. We praise your name. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, God, that you're so awesome. That you got everything under control. That, Lord, you know the beginning from the end, the end from the beginning. God, you know what's for us. Lord, you know what's in our best interest. And, Lord, help us, God, to trust you and to know that you've got this. And nothing we can say or do can outdo what you've got for us. I ask you right now, Lord, to minister to us and through us. Help us keep our minds settled on you, our eyes focused on you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. The church said Amen. You know, I, you be seated. I was thinking about that in the cognitive block again, in cognitive block. And, and all I can think about it is that Jesus, did you see Jesus ever doing anything always the same? He did things different. Some people, he just, he grabbed by the hand and pulled up a dead person uh, uh, with an ain't son. Uh, uh, he goes, uh, all these things, he takes him by the hand sometimes. He rubs uh, dirt, mud spits and dirt, and opens blind eyes. Other lays his hand on him. He always does something different. You know why he does it different? Again, to show you, to keep you away from that cognitive block and lock, thinking that God does everything the same all the time. God is forever the same. He never changes. But the way he, the way he reveals himself, uh, although, although the principles never change, ever, the way that he brings them forth does change. Amen? How many here today rode up on a horse and buggy? If you're driving a Ford, you probably thought you did. <laughs> I'm playing. Look, look. How many in here today, when you got this morning, you had to stoke a fire uh, in, your, in your kitchen to get breakfast going? How many here had to crush the, the, the coffee and, and, and put it in there? And, and, and all? We didn't because things change. And we welcome new change. Amen? But you know what I found out? One thing... Watch this. One thing, I'm getting another sermon. I'm trying not to, but it just keeps going in that direction. One thing every person hates, number one, don't say number one, is change. The number two thing people hate is things staying the way they are. How 
How many has had some very bad things in your life? You just hope it stays that way. I want it to stay there, but I enjoy getting slapped. I enjoy getting hurt. I enjoy getting beat down. No. But then let's do some changing. Well, I don't want to change. Okay, so here we go. Let's get back over here now. Y'all said let's get back on target. <laughs> okay, you go. How many people, I'm going to talk about, I'm just going to throw real fast the slides that we had last week. Just so the first people that weren't here will know this. They'll see if I'm not going to stay on it. How many people, how many know people that remind you of this? Hands on the chalkboard. Oh, God. This, oh. We all had them. We have them in our past. We have them in our present. You're going to have them in your future. You can't always avoid them. Ever. You cannot avoid them, but you can learn how to handle them. So, so here's what we're talking about. This is how to handle people that are difficult. Number one, this was last, this is last week. Number one, make sure you're not the one being difficult. Sometimes we get so set on something that we think that our way is the right way and they've got it the wrong way and they're being difficult. You know, uh, uh, like the guys are riding around, the guys are riding, uh, riding down the road with his wife and he comes around a curve and the guy's on the side of the road and he hollers. Dollars. Cow! The guy got mad, thought he was talking about his life. He said, Pig! And run around the curb and get a cow. <laughs> Cut it out of his car. <laughs> Sometimes we don't realize we think it's somebody else is being difficult, but it's us. The problems that, that have their origin in our own heart. So let God fix ourselves first. I tell people when marriage counts, the very first thing is don't you try to fix your spouse. You try to fix yourself. You try to be all you can be for God. If you be all you can be for God and be the best spouse you can be, I promise you, within weeks, you'll see a change in that spouse. Promise. May not be exactly, but it'll start anyway. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowness of mind that each esteem themselves better than themselves, that each of you look not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. So, make sure you're not the one being hard to get along with. I mean, no sandpaper people. They just greet you every time you get around them. Good Lord, have mercy. Remember this, don't try to change the other person. People change when they want to, not when you want them to. Y'all say that. People change when they want to, not when I want them to. Okay? So we don't know how to break them. We don't know where to break them. We don't know how much to break them. This is God's job. So, so, you know, you want to get some rest tonight if you're trying to break somebody and fix them? Let me just tell you something. I'm going to help you sleep tonight and get some rest. Get off the throne and put God back up there. Amen? As long as you're up on the throne, you cannot fix anybody. Get off the throne. Get your husband, your wife, your children off of your sanding block, off of your spinning wheel, and let God handle it. He can do it a whole lot better than we can. For it is... God who worketh in you both willing to do of his good pleasure, Philippians 2.13. We're considering this, they may not be God, they may be God's sandpaper, and God could be changing you. Amen? And here we go. I'm almost through with last week. Don't lecture. Lectures can turn into nagging, and nagging builds walls instead of bridges. Nagging sounds like the fingers on the chalkboard, the fingernails. Since now you use it creates more problems than it solves, save your breath. Proverbs 15 and 1 says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Better is well in the corner of a house than, than in a house shared with a contentious woman or man. Don't lecture. Here's the last one from last week. And I, I'm not even going to go read right on them last week, but I'm not going to do it this week. Ready? Don't protect them from their consequences. When you protect other people from their consequences, you're actually doing them a disservice. You're becoming an enabler. I talk to parents all the time, and they're talking about their children. I'm going, and, and, and I'm, I'm telling you, you're, you're enabling them. If you'll stop enabling them, then God can do something. But as long as you're enabling them and protecting them from all their consequences, they're never going to learn. You're always going to be going and getting them out of trouble. D.C. and Daniel both told me, and they told Bethany. Because one time Bethany, I told Bethany, I said, Bethany, Bethany, look, now you, you're, you're 18 years old. I've been working with you and working with you, and you just don't seem to get it through your skull what I'm trying to tell you. So guess what? I'm going to back off and just let you have it. And so she said, well, that's good, Dad. Well, about two months later, she said, Dad, why'd you back off? 
said, I told you I was going to back up. Said, but since you backed off, things have gotten bad. I said, why have they gotten bad? He said, because you're not there to fix everything. I said, really? And then D.C. and Daniel, she was crying to D.C. and Daniel. They said, oh, oh dry it up, buttercup. Said, you ought to see how Dad did that to us. Said, y'all, Dad take you and just, just, just laid it out for you on a little bitty pedestal and took you in, in roses and did it for you. He said, Daddy got hard on us, but both of them said the best thing Daddy ever did to us when we got to the right age, especially was he quit enabling us, and he said, you take care of it yourself. And he said, that's when we grew into men. So most people don't, most people don't learn uh, 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 new behaviors until they find out the old behaviors have stopped working. Now, they're going to get mad at you. I've got, I mean, I know there's people who get mad and fire when you back off. But when you back off, you, make, you cause them. You push them. You, 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 you know, and I, I, I want to talk about this later on, too, but an eagle. The way an eagle, Mama Eagle builds her nest is she starts out with thorns, big old thorns, thick thorns. And then she comes around and she puts tree limbs in it. And then she comes around the tree limbs and then she puts feathers in it. And then she goes around the feathers and she puts hide in it. And those baby eagles are in there in that hide and they're so cozy and everything's awesome. But there comes a time when the mama knows that if they stay in the nest too long, it's going to be dangerous for them. They can't grow any further. So what she does is, the Bible says, is, as the eagle stirs her nest, so God will stir Israel, stir us. Stir the nest means he acts. The eagle goes in first and takes away the skin. Okay? So now you're starting to feel just a little bit discomfort, but the feathers are there. As you move around, if you're not careful, you'll get a little thorn every now and then. But then the mama goes in and takes the feathers out. And now you got sticks and you got thorns. And man, is it really getting uncomfortable? When it's time, Mama says, okay, it's time to learn how to fly. She takes out all the sticks. There's nothing but thorns. Some of y'all right now in your life are thinking, man, I used to have it so cushioned. It's not so cushioned anymore. What's going on? God's preparing you to fly, to get higher heights. So, yes, it's uncomfortable for a while, but remember, most people don't learn new behaviors until the old behaviors stop working. Now, now here we go. This, here we go. We're going to go into this week. Ready? Ooh, what in the world happened there? Good Lord, have mercy. That thing went absolutely crazy. Let's see here. Wake up. Wake up, my little Susie. Wake up. All right. Let's try it again. Let's try it again. We don't want to go to that joke again. Y'all don't come sparing all the time. All right. Here we go. We're going to get this. PowerPoint is something good, but it works. So I must have really hit something hard. Okay, ready and action. Don't allow yourselves. This is so hard. When you back off of people, let them suffer their consequences. When you back off and let them see a little bit of what they're doing to you and everybody, everybody else, when you back off and let them, them experience some of this stuff, if you're not careful... You will allow yourself to become caught up in the other person's emotional outburst. I cannot believe over the years some of the things I've heard children call their parents. Call them. You know, and I would just, Ugh. I can't believe you just called them that. I can't believe you just said that to your parents, but their parents didn't do exactly what they wanted and they let them have it. I'm thinking, good Lord, child, if that parent pulled away, you wouldn't have anything. What's going on? You see, Remember, if somebody gets in that emotional outburst, two wrongs don't make a right, but three lefts make a right turn. Tell her that. Okay. I just put it in for the fun of it, that part. If someone is ranting, or worse, you have, listen, or ranting at you, or worse, maybe even threatening you, especially if you haven't done what they wanted you to do, this person is a very difficult person. And especially if they're only thinking about themselves, they don't think about you or the consequences. Here's why this one. If someone's ranting or even causing or possibly causing you body harm, you have the right, listen carefully, to get up and leave. That sounds hard, don't it? 
But you know what? If you get up and leave, number one, they're going to realize you're not going to put up with that kind of talk. Or number two, you may even save them from a visit by the law to put them in for domestic abuse and or for being for cutting you or hitting you or something. Because sometimes people get rent and they don't. They, they don't even realize what they're doing until they've already done it and then they're apologetic about it. So, so, if I get around somebody and they get talking like that and I can't seem to calm them down, I gotta tell you what. It's like F block. Now, this is how it worked in F block, where they, F block, the federal block, the prison within the prison. I was at the table trying to talk the word of God to these prisoners and another prisoner who was probably emotionally messed up anyway. He ran across the facility and jumped up on the table where I was ministering and got right in my face. He just jumped in the right in the face. And as other guys can tell you, if you give in to that, you've lost it because they smell fear. So I just looked you right back in the face. And I said, when you get through, we'll finish this. Are you through yet? And he went, well, I guess I am. He can't sit back down. We finished it. Versus, oh, we be no, 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 no. You see, kind of hard to walk away when you're locked behind bars in there with them. But still, when somebody is losing control, it's okay to walk away. Emotions are highly contagious. Remember this now. Emotions are highly contagious. If somebody's coming at you with extreme anger, you can become angry too. If you're going to somebody and you're just as happy as you can be, you're just trying to trying to be good to them, trying to talk to them, and they've done, done this outburst of blaming you for something you didn't even do. Next thing you know, you're mad. Your whole day is ruined. You listen, it's okay. Y'all say it's okay to walk away. Say it. You ain't got to leave the person forever, but for that moment, that moment, it's better to walk away and let that person know that you're not going to be talked to that way and also prevent any kind of domestic violence than to stay there and try to calm them down, especially if you're not trained to do that and or beyond, beyond it, okay? So make the conscious effort to remain calm. Proverbs 22, 24 to 25 says, Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man do not go, lest you learn his ways and set a snare for your own soul. So, here you go, one more. Yeah, remember, this is good stuff, isn't it? Isn't it? Yes. Okay, here we go. Stand up for yourself. I, I see so many people just don't stand up for themselves. You know, uh, uh, either the person in front of you has been in a mode. Look, there's a lot of people in your life that if you're not careful, you might not even have realized this. They have become emotional bullies in your life. And the most of bullying in your life could even be, look, it could be your spouse, it could be your children, it could be your, 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 your siblings, it could even be parents, it can be friends, it can be co-workers. But, and they might not even realize it, but they have become emotional bullies. And they will run over you until you say what they want to hear. Or they will withdraw from you until... You say or do what they want done. So it's very important you understand this and don't fall for that trap of being sucked in to, okay, if, if, if I do what he says, he'll get tolerant of me. If I do what she says, then she'll come back. If I do what she says, then they'll open up the gate. No, when they're being emotionally bullied, when you're being emotionally bullied, again, stand up yourself. It's okay. Look, watch this. It's time to start taking care of yourself. It doesn't require an angry outburst. Just being a calm, mature, resolute manner. Just, just because, you know, <laughs> I can tell you, the person, whenever, whenever, whenever I think about that, look, look, Doug, I don't want to embarrass you. But I think about Doug. I've seen him at the prison. I've seen those guys come down on him, and he just go, really? Really? I'm thinking, somebody else would go, oh, 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 o
You know, and so 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 when I grow up, I'm gonna be like Doug. I won't change my name, change to Deep Hammer, okay? <laughs> be calm, be mature, be resolute. For he himself said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So you know, boldly say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Now, there's a lot of y'all like to be like when I grow up, but the reason I said Doug is because the rest of y'all won't go up in prison. Well, some of y'all do, let's see. I, Oh, yeah, there's a couple of y'all. Let's see. Who goes to prison? Raise your hand. <laughs> you only raise your hands. Good Lord. <laughs> y'all guys are called too, but I'm getting minister with y'all. Y'all were gone away from me. Y'all were everywhere else. I'm, I just carried somebody back there with me. All right, ready? <laughs> I'm trying to dig out the hole I just dug. All right. So, here we go. Ready? We're all fallen creatures. And all very hard to live with. C.S. Lewis said that we're all fallen creatures and we're very hard to live with. Wow. So after you've stood up for yourself, do forgive. Watch this. If you can't forgive those who hurt you, you're hurting yourself more than you're hurting anyone else. I see people all the time think as long as I withhold from them, as long as I just stay mad at them, as long as I don't talk to them, as long as I stay angry, then I'm hurting them. No, you're not. You're not hurting them at all. There's a good chance they don't even know that they hurt you. And so if you're just staying angry at them and going, what's going on, man? Talk to me. What, what, what's happening? And you just stay mad at them. And they may not even know they hurt you. The only person you're hurting is yourself. So, so, so. Forgiveness should not be confused with enabling. I'm not going to enable them, but I am going to forgive them. And not to forgive the difficult person in your life, you're not compelled to accept continued mistreatment. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. And here, here's my favorite. I practice this all the time. Y'all that know me know that I practice this all the time. Billy Graham said, A keen sense of humor helps us to overlook the unbecoming, understand the unconventional, tolerate the unpleasant, overcome the unexpected, and outlast the unbearable. That was Billy Graham, the holiest man in the world. Learn to laugh at difficult times. Life always has a lighter side. Look for but especially when times are tough. Laughter is a medicine for the soul, so take your medicine early and often. Proverbs 17, 22. I can read that one again. Laughter is medicine for the soul, so take your medicine early and often. And then finally, I'm closing. No one person can drive us crazy as we give them the keys. I saw something yesterday where it says, 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 uh, so you cut somebody, you cut somebody out your life and they're mad, but they're the ones who gave you the scissors. The same way, no one can drive you crazy unless you give them the keys. So here we go. Do accept personal responsibility. Amen. Look, make your own corner of the world peaceful, productive. Purposeful. If your world is a little crazy, <laughs> which mine usually is, perhaps it's time to consult who you see in the mirror. Wow. It amazes me over the years. You know, I, it's one thing when you're in the middle of the battle and there's two of us and we're going at it. But then somebody from the outside watches and sees all that's going on and they go, hey dude, maybe you ought to think about it. And you go, whoa, you, 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 you see what you're saying? I got to change? <laughs> Hold on just a minute. Have you considered what you're doing? How you handling it? It's so easy that your emotions get in the way. And if you start thinking emotionally, you can lose out on some of the best opportunities to minister, some of the best opportunities for friendship, 
some of the best opportunities to, to receive peace because you let your emotions get in the way. And then finally, with God's help, you can discover peace that passes all understanding. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, Don't fret or worry. Instead of worry, pray. That petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers. Letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good, will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. Wow. So, uh, BJ, Jeff, y'all come on up here. I want y'all to play something for us. DC's not here. Y'all come up and play something for us. Everybody stand. God is so awesome. All the time. God is awesome. It's hard to deal with people that don't want to be dealt with. Some people just don't want you to deal with them. They want to keep you off balance. Remember, if somebody's trying to keep you off balance, whether they know it or not, they have become an emotional bully. All they want to do is keep you off balance. Do you know when, uh, have you ever seen uh, lion tamers? Do they come at the lion like this? Ever? How do they come at the lion? You know why lion tamers come at lions like that? Because the lion tries to focus on all four legs at one time. If you did that, they would focus and eat you up. But like this, they're kind of staying off balance because they get focused on this one, then they see this one, they get back off focus. They get over here, they get over here. And so you can take that chair and you can do what you want with it because they're going, whoa, whoa. Well, Emotional bullies. Here you go. Here it is. I'll turn you off. <laughs> Emotional bullies. I'm sorry. <laughs> Emotional bullies. You do that too. They keep doing everything at you. Trying to keep you off balance. They might not even realize they're being the bully. But they're right there at you. And you can never solve one thing because they keep doing more things at you. When that happens, say, so whoa. One thing at a time, please. One thing at a time. I trust God to help them work it out. Every head bowed, every eye closed. No looking around. Right now. Lord, Lord. there are 
difficult people in my life. And because of my relationship, I cannot get away from me. I need you, Lord, to help me watch myself that I don't become the difficult one. Give me the courage when I need to to walk away. Give me the courage to stand up for myself. Y'all say it, I can't hear you. Give me the courage to forgive. Give me the courage not to enable